All right, everyone, we're going to stay on track for the afternoon. Uh, I noticed there's less people in this room that are out. What's wrong with you people? Get everyone to, you know, next time, get in here, get in here. Uh, uh, the hallway track. I know this, you know, every year we get people saying, you know, the best part about this event is the hallway track, but this afternoon we're really going to make up for it. Uh, we've got some really cool uh, announcements coming this afternoon uh, to follow on the already awesome announcements we had this morning. Uh, you know, again, the Continuous Development Foundation, the merger of the Node.js Foundation, the JavaScript Foundation, the GraphQL, uh, just so many uh, amazing announcements, and uh, we have even more to come. Uh, but I do want to get serious for a minute uh, with everyone here. Um, so, you know, this, this is an event where leaders from the open source uh, industry and community all get together. The, that's why we call it the Open Source uh, Leadership Summit. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we're always concerned about is you know, part of open source is that there's just an anti-establishment sensibility. That, like, why could you go to that meeting and I didn't get to go to that meeting? And, you know, uh, this is just one of the few events the Linux Foundation does uh, for our members. The rest of our events are obviously uh, open to everyone. But uh, the, the conversation I want to have this afternoon is as leaders in the industry as it relates to open source, in the community, uh, as open source maintainers or very prominent developers, uh, we need to sort of think about uh, how we can make something that has, is so good, that has uh, enriched ourselves and enriched in others at the same time, something we all like to talk about, something this concept that all of us are smarter than any one of us, how can we make that even better? Like, you know, remember that IBM ad that I showed this morning where that little kid was, you know, being communicated to and learning from everyone? Well, part of the other part of open source that is so powerful is its adaptability. Uh, and we have some cha serious challenges, and I think I want to show another ad from that series uh, about some things that we should think about this afternoon. And we roll the video there. It is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Change is something that all of us have to think about. And more and more these days, as open source becomes part and parcel to your business success, to literally the backbone of the internet, of our global economy, something that uh, not only empowers us to do amazing things like the drones you saw this morning or the new 5G solutions that are coming out of uh, AT&T, but it also is a double-edged sword where if it isn't sustained properly, if it's not maintained by a massive collective effort, the security and privacy of all of us is also at risk. And that's what I want to talk to you all about this afternoon and issue some challenges for this group so that we can all collectively lead to better sustain open source. And you know, I started the event this morning by talking about open source sustainability and describing how great projects work. And they all work very, very similarly. Linux being sort of the best example of this, but you know, Kubernetes and others are also in this category. You have this amazing upstream project. You know, Linux changes nine times an hour. It, it, it is the fastest growing, most prolific, largest, most successful open source project ever. And it is used not just to make products, but it's used to power uh, almost every global stock exchange. It's used for uh, systems that we, telecommunication systems, uh, all of the internet systems that we rely on every single day. You know, companies use open source. You know, you don't build a GoPro with your own operating system. You take Linux, you implement it, uh, you uh, make, create a lot of value. And that value does get reinvested. Most Linux kernel developers today are professional developers. Uh, most of them are somewhere around the hallway track here because they don't ever come to the keynotes, but they're pros. <laughs> um, and this works. You know, the, the, the idea of a developer who's using Linux to run uh, a 
multi-hundred million subscriber 5G network in China uh, for China Mobile is providing not only labor back into the Linux kernel project, but more importantly, the innovation positive feedback loop of understanding what it's actually like to run an 850 million user global network. Uh, that, that information, that innovation gets put back into the project in a really interesting, not only positive feedback loop of labor economics, but in, of innovation economics. And so the serious conversation we want to have this afternoon is what happens, what are the implications when that virtuous cycle does not work? And we've seen some recent and even not so recent examples of, of what ends up happening. Everybody remembers Heartbleed. How many people here remember Heartbleed in the, in the OpenSSL project? How many people here know that post Heartbleed, we created something called the Core Infrastructure Initiative. We paid the two core maintainers of OpenSSL, Andy Polya and Steve Henson, $300,000 per year each to work full time on OpenSSL for three years. They helped refactor that code base, put down the bug backlog, significantly improved the shape of OpenSSL. We paid uh, Chet Ramey to work on Bash. We worked with uh, Harlan down at the uh, NTPD project to pay him to work full time on NTPD in order to improve its security. Uh, the uh, OpenSSH maintainer, Theo Durat, paid him. This is one of the most important projects out there. Theo had been kind of going on his own. These were important things. Three, four years later, the question is what lessons did we learn? about these projects that stand at the intersection of critical to the privacy and security of all of us and truly troubled in terms of resources, in terms of the state of the project that expose us to an Equifax breach or a heart bleed or worse. And the unfortunate answer was very Tolstoy-esque that we generally found that most healthy open source projects were similar but that there was just a varying set of circumstances across all of these different projects in terms of why they broke down and how they broke down. And it could have been a labor issue, a personality issue, a governance issue. It, could have, it was just there were so many different things we learned. Uh, but you know, we, we started to try and figure out patterns. One of the patterns is the world itself isn't getting an early warning signal here in a meaningful and effective way. The other thing that we understand is that a huge amount of the code we depend on is written by a bunch of unsung heroes who maybe don't appear on stage at a Linux Foundation event or in front of 12,000 people at KubeCon. As Dan Kahn incessantly reminds me, they're gonna have 12,000 people at KubeCon, the biggest open source developer event ever. Uh, but there's this whole set of other developers, and they number in the thousands, kind of working in the background. And I want to show you what these folks look like. You know, they could be at an open SSL. You know, the, the, the Steve Henson and Steve Marquez for so many years maintained open SSL and funded it through uh, doing FIPS uh, compliance certification for, uh, uh, to help fund that project for pay. Uh, a lot of people were pretty scared to hear that the internet at one point in time was essentially secured uh, by two guys named Steve. But there's a whole bunch of other Steves out there. And Bobs and Sues and Kristens and Toms and here's what they look like. Code gets built like this these days. You choose a framework. Node.js, Ruby, Python, you name it. You write your code, you're writing a web app, whatever it is, mobile app, you name it. And then you use open source libraries to solve problems, right? This is what everybody does. Like, they pull down different NPM packages, they write this code, right? And most of this code is open source. And we know at the Linux Foundation that the core Node.js maintainers uh, which we all work with. These are very uh, uh, special and interesting folks who work on the core framework. We know who they are, they're supported. We have the, the uh, OpenJS Foundation, we have ways of doing that. But what about these folks? 
this long tail of developers who work on essentially your dependencies, right? When you build an application, you create these dependencies on all these other packages out there that a whole bunch of people are writing, in some cases independently, in some cases collectively. This is who we need to think about. And it's not just code uh, that's being written here. There uh, are things that are needed for healthy open source so that all of our code can be more, better quality, more robust, more secure. And there are just certain things that uh, rumor has it developers uh, do not like to do. I'm trying to think of a few of them. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of them, it turns out. <laughs> Testing, Q&A, documentation, security audits, dependency analysis, and so forth. And you know, as we were like, trying to figure out like, how uh, we could improve this and, and trying to figure out like, why this was happening, uh, a, a very prominent developer tipped me off that there's actually a series of books that explains uh, some of the non-code uh, or, or some of the dynamics around uh, these things not getting done in a lot of open source projects. I hadn't seen this series before, uh, but I hear it's extremely popular uh, with a lot of developers. Uh, I mean, just nobody likes to write tests, you know, nobody likes to do uh, a lot of this stuff. But this all boils down to one thing. For those projects that are critical to the security and integrity of the internet, that long tail of developers who work on these dependencies that we all need, is that they need more resources. Uh, and we hear this all the time. Uh, I showed this quote this morning. Uh, a developer wrote this, you know, talking about, you know, listen, it, 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 everyone thinks you have to buy hardware, but you know, who can afford to maintain all this software? It actually is real work. How can somebody uh, do that for free? Does anybody know, like, uh, has anybody met this developer or know who it might be? Yeah. All right, you've, yeah, you've, you've heard me say this before. Uh, it was Bill Gates. In 1976, in an open letter to hobbyists, uh, describing how, you know, this, back then, uh, software developers needed to get paid. I hear that Bill did actually end up getting compensated well <laughs> for his work. Um, but here's another interesting thing is I looked up, you know, I, I, we're like, why, why is this happening? Why is it that software developers aren't getting compensated for a lot of this kind of work? And it turns out developers actually is, it, are getting compensated and it's a pretty good job. Four of the top 10 highest paying jobs in America in 2018 based on median salary are software related. Enterprise architects, software development managers, software engineering managers, software architects. Uh, I mean, I saw this and I'm like, yes, developers are getting paid. In fact, the only question I have about this statistic is why corporate counsel is number five? I just <laughs> don't get that one. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. If ever there's an opportunity for a lawyer joke, I always take it. <laughs> They're Dolan right there. There's our, our <laughs> counsel right in the front here. Um, <laughs> um, we also do, do surveys every year on open source jobs, right? And in 2018, the demand for open source developers is actually extremely high. Like, everybody wants to hire open source developers. Like, I actually, it's, it's, I get more phone calls and emails about, Jim, do you know someone who knows C, is a kernel developer, writes, you know, like, I just, it's a constant stream into my, uh, inbox for them. What's also interesting is that uh, we surveyed all of these folks who are open source developers in a professional setting and, and the overwhelming response, uh, which I think is, is somewhat expected to this audience, was they love what they do more than what they get paid. And I think part of that, and there's a whole bunch of academic research out of uh, MIT and Harvard that backs this up, which is that the extrinsic value, the money in open source is one thing, you gotta have it, but the intrinsic motivation of mastering one's craft, solving tough problems, about being a part of a community bigger than yourself is, this, is much more inspiring 
What's incredible about it is that somehow we've managed to marry the two where open source developers are not only like 87% of hiring managers want more open source talent and want to pay that talent, but you get the same sense of community and motivation and joint problem solving at the same time. Which leads me to this, the paradox, uh, which is even though there are more job opportunities than ever in computer science, in every aspect, some open source maintainers, not all, but many, are still not getting the funds they need for their projects to thrive. Why? Because we've been thinking a lot about this, and there's a whole cottage industry. There are tons of organizations that are trying to help solve this problem. GitPay, Gratipay, uh, Tidelift is an interesting one. This is a commercial software company, a sort of commercial service company is about probably a better description, that sort of targets those long tail developers and you can subscribe to Tidelift and you can uh, get uh, some kind of, of a, a support uh, or, or some kind of commitment to maintain uh, that long tail of projects that you particularly depend on as a single enterprise. Uh, there's uh, Lots of uh, blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency related uh, efforts. Uh, those may be, I, I'm, I'm a little more unclear about whether a, a cryptocurrency related effort is going to be effective. I, I went back and read Linus's original email from 1991. Uh, hey, Minix folks, uh, my name's Linus Torvalds. I'm building this uh, operating system. It's more of a hobby. Uh, we're having an initial coin offering I've incorporated in the Cayman Islands, and if you uh, get your credit card, uh, not sure if that one would have worked, but uh, hey, you know, like, all of these are good. Everyone should be trying to figure out ways to provide that same kind of positive economic feedback loop that makes open source great, and we do, you know, nobody knows the answer. Uh, to, to what uh, any of these things will end up uh, doing. Some of them will fail, um, some of them may succeed, we, we just don't know. Uh, but I think that the real question here, that it, this is the challenge that I want to ask all of you to think about, is nobody's questioning that developers should get paid or not. Like, they should, and get paid more. And those silent developers that are working on stuff you depend on, we should pay them. You know, if, if they need help, let's reach out and give it to them. You know, it doesn't have to be throwing money randomly, but reach a helping hand. They're helping you help them. But I don't think that's the question. We depend on these folks. They should get paid. The real question is, what is our collective responsibility to make sure open source software projects thrive? When is it more than a helping hand? When is it that we all need to work together because something bigger is at stake? And I want to offer today a few th theories on, on when that might be the case. I think we can all agree that this is the first thing that comes to mind. This is what people tell me more than you can possibly <laughs> count. Uh, that when our collective privacy and security is at risk, when Apache struts is only patched whenever there's a vulnerability by essentially one guy, when OpenSSL is floundering, when OpenSSH, which provides secure communication between servers, is maintained by Theo kind of on his own, we need to think about that. We need to think about what our responsibility is to fix that. And that this is actually a tough problem. I know that because we've given out millions and millions of dollars to these projects. And we decided a year ago to take a deeper look. And the idea here was we needed to answer three simple questions so that we could understand when we have a collective responsibility here. The first question is, what is the most important shared software in the world? And I'm not talking about OpenSSL every time, right? They're a great example. They're the one everybody talks about. But I want to know who is collectively running across everyone by vertical industry, by package, by version number, 
based on some form of criticality. What are you running in production, and is it critical or not? And when I say critical or not, is it network facing? Is crypto involved? Give me the list. Package, version number, criticality, by industry sector, utilities, retail, aerospace and defense, financial services. That actually is an insanely difficult answer to get, right? You would have to go in and apply software composition analysis tools to every company you could possibly talk to to get a statistical sample. You would have to anonymize and correlate that data by package and version number. You would have to then come up with an algorithmic way to come up with a criticality score. And then, and only then, can you get on to the next question, which is who wrote this stuff, right? Who, who is writing the most critical software in the world? And I'm not talking just their GitHub handle. Who are these people? Because ultimately it is people who are doing this work. Who are these maintainers? What are their names? Where do they live? What motivates them? What do they think about? You can't fix something unless the people who can actually fix it are on board. What's the health of that community? Do they get along with each other? Are they experiencing financial problems? What is it? If you can't figure out what the most important software in the world is and who wrote it, then you can't get to the third question, which is how do we help those projects help become healthy and more secure? What kind of incentives we can, can we give them? Is, the, is it money? Is it seconding engineers from any of your companies who have some of the best engineers in the world to go help these people? Can we give them tools? You know, Google probably has these amazing, like the fuzzing tools that have come out of some of the companies that all of you work for, uh, the, the application testing tools and so forth are amazing. How can we apply these resources? These are the questions we need to ask. This is how we can solve the idea of open source sustainability, not just for the big projects, but for all projects, which will help all of us. And these are really tough questions, and we want to answer them. We've uh, engaged in a partnership with uh, Harvard University's Lab for Innovation Science at Harvard Business School uh, to create what we're calling our Census II. So as part of our core infrastructure initiative several years ago, we did a census of what the most important software in the world is, uh, uh, the, its criticality score. But we mainly did this based on the Linux platforms out there, and we came up with you know, gzip and bash and OpenSSL and the usual suspects. But we need to go much bigger than that. We're working with software composition analysis vendors, people who actually have this data in a statistical form, who are working with Harvard to anonymize that, because that information is not something that you know, people want to share with the rest of the world. But we can anonymize and aggregate in a way that gives us enough of an idea of what these shared software packages are, so that we can get an idea, better than shooting in the dark. And then the Linux Foundation is going to work to do the next part, figure out who these folks are. We are actually in a unique position at the Linux Foundation. We have some great people on staff here, Kate Stewart and others, who are working on what I like to call open source archaeology. Going back and looking at all these projects and trying to track the provenance to the people who actually wrote this so we can understand what they think, what they do, if their communities are healthy or not. So this is something we have underway right now. And that's not even what we're announcing today. What we want to understand is how we can affect change once we get to the end of that third question. It's that third question that I want to talk about today. And this is another one where I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm throwing up yet again another letter from Bill Gates. <laughs> Turns out the guy's super smart. <laughs> Back in January 2002, he sent a note out to all employees at Microsoft about software security. At the time, Microsoft was having meaningful challenges relative to the software quality and security of its products that were sort of freaking out its customers, if you recall, at that time. And, and you know, Bill Gates said, we're going to create this thing called the Trustworthy Computer Computing Initiative. Uh, he worked with a gentleman named Steve Lipner uh, to implement it. Steve has actually been helping us at the Core Infrastructure Initiative. He's a terrific guy. If you ever get to hang out with Steve Lipner, I highly recommend it. Uh, but the note cut to the chase was, 
We're going to take secure coding classes. We're going to test our code. We're going to read all the code. We're going to audit the code. We're going to create this entirely new process for uh, application security, or in, in his words, trustworthy computing. And it worked. Like Microsoft's code actually got quite a bit better. Uh, and the question for all of us is, that worked at Microsoft because Bill Gates had one last line that wasn't explicitly in the letter, and I'm maybe like embellishing a little bit here, but like the implication, as far as I could understand from the letter, is if you don't do this, you're going to be fired. <laughs> we don't have that in open source. No, you can't fire anyone. Trust me, I know. <laughs> uh, what we need to do is change our culture. We need to create a culture of secure coding. And I don't have all the answers today. I'm asking you, I'm challenging this group to help me with these answers. We've tried in the core infrastructure initiative to come up with some incentive structures. We have a badging program for our core infrastructure initiatives where I think a couple hundred, 250 odd projects have passed, a couple thousand are applying, where people come in and they have to demonstrate that they take secure coding and the maintenance of their projects seriously. It's not security theater, you have to really do this work. And uh, that has initially gotten some positive outcomes. We require this for many of our projects. I think the CNCF requires this for any project in the Cloud Native Computing Project uh, Foundation in order to graduate to their top level. But 250 projects, a couple thousand there, we need to do more, right? The other thing that we need to do is not just provide incentives, but we need to continually focus on diversity. Maybe one of the reasons, and I don't know if there's an exact causal effect here, that this stuff is happening is because we're too myopic. You know, we come out here, we're all in the hallway track, you never come to hear me speak, it's really annoying, you're talking to each other all the time. Uh, but we need diversity from different cultures, and we need diversity from underrepresented communities. I, I showed this this morning, I'm showing it again. This is not a good statistic. And it is, there is no doubt that diverse communities create better outcomes, that if we get more people's perspectives, we are going to be stronger and we need to work on this. That is what we've been thinking about at the Linux Foundation a lot. How can we promote better application security, create a culture of secure coding? How can we provide more resources? How can you all provide more resources to these projects? And how can we get more diversity into our communities all at once? And so what we've done is built a software platform called Community Bridge. Community Bridge is a tool that we're offering to open source communities these communities who need help to provide them with resources and help solve their key challenges. How can we help provide funding to these projects? How can they make requests to everyone to help them? How can we give them security visibility to their dependencies? How can we provide secure enterprise grade security tools to these open source developers? And finally, how can we match people with funding requests to improve security in a way that promotes diversity. So how could we, for example, fund an in, a mentorship program where mentees come in to the Linux kernel project and work on the huge bug backlog of some are security vulnerabilities, some are just outright bugs that Google is publishing every single day. It's a really impressive list. Greg complains about it all the time. How could we provide funding so that those mentees were from diverse backgrounds, pair them with mentors in an automated way, and then have you all, companies that depend on open source, offer job interviews to those mentees at the end of their program so that they could find jobs? good pay and healthcare benefits and labor rights, fund open source projects, disclose, find security problems, fix bugs, underwrite diversity, more diversity, better security, more resources all at once. That's what we've built. It's targeted for use of 
Linux Foundation projects, but mainly for those critical and emerging under-resourced projects that we all really use and depend on. For the other 78 million projects on GitHub or for your private repos, you're on your own. Uh, we're not saying that we're going to close the door forever, but like that's not our focus today. Here's what we're offering. The first module that we're offering in this platform is a funding platform. This is a crowdfunding platform that will allow maintainers to come in, register on the platform, raise funds for their projects, set a set of funding goals. The Linux Foundation is going to provide matching grants uh, to underwrite the goals for those projects. We'll have an accounting transparent ledger where projects can be reimbursed through an expense management application. We'll be able to fund these through not only credit cards uh, right over the internet, but also through purchase orders and recurring commitments from any one of you, because the Linux Foundation has purchasing relationships with over 1,500 technology companies worldwide who are dependent on open source. We're also providing standards and best practices for those projects as they come in and make funding requests. Do you have a CII batch? Do you have a code of conduct policy in place? Do you have a modicum of governance? All of this will be in the funding module. In addition, we're providing security visibility and enterprise-grade security tools to these projects. We're providing a commercial-grade dependency analysis tool. We'll be doing vulnerability detection for all these projects. There will be a way that you can literally go in, click on vulnerabilities through the dependency analysis, and remediate them through suggested remedies right in the application. We've integrated with bug bounty programs in order to underwrite and provide bug bounty programs for open source projects that wouldn't normally be able to stand up a bug bounty program on their own. We'll provide metrics about the project, metrics of how they're spending their resources, who's participating in it, what their bug backlogs are, diversity statistics, and so forth. We're even providing static code analysis, and particularly this is important to the Linux kernel project, so that we can bind bugs quicker and fix them faster. Finally, our community bridge people component helps with this diversity issue and brings new blood into open source in an automated way from any country on earth, from anyone with any background who has the skills to come in and give it helping hand, be paired with a mentor, be given a shot to succeed and have a career through participating in some of the most important open source projects in the world. Projects can go in, set financial goals, maybe do a security scan and say, hey, we got to fix all this stuff. They can then set up the skills they need to solve those problems. They can invite mentors from their community who automatically sign up as mentors through a web UI, publish what they're looking for, uh, those mentors have a set of guidelines and selection criteria that they can all set up in an automated way. Mentees can create profiles of their skills. They can take tests in order to show and demonstrate those skills. The uh, mentors themselves can set up timelines where they want to do a three-month or maybe a six-month program. Then finally, employers can sign up to either underwrite those mentorship programs, or even more importantly, get qualified candidates at the end of those mentorship programs that you can interview for jobs at your firm. You don't have to hire, but if you sign up, we'd like you to give these people a shot at an interview. So your companies and organizations can all participate. You can support your stack. We have an integration with stackshare.io that shows through a crowdsourced way which of your companies are using what open source and how you can support it. You can find new diverse talent and sign up for the mentoring program. Uh, you can monitor progress through the dashboard and more. The Linux Foundation is also taking the lead on supporting developers and this is the challenge I want to offer out to all of you today. We are going to be providing matching grants for the first 100 mentees and mentors through this program. We're structuring the mentorship program so that mentees will, for a three-month uh, program, 
receive $5,500 stipend plus a $500 travel uh, stipend to participate in a three-month program. For the Colonel community, we're not even going to bother with the match. We're just going to outright fund some uh, mentees right off the bat. The second thing we're doing is every dollar goes to developer for the first 10 million bucks. Meaning we're going to eat the Stripe fees. We're not going to charge any kind of fee. We're not doing this. You know, there's no IPO at the end of the Linux Foundation rainbow here. We want to fix and help these communities, right? Every dollar goes to the developer. We want to, we're, we've hired a new Linux Foundation fellow. Our third <laughs> Linux kernel fellow. Uh, where is Shua Khan? Is she right? There she is, all right. Wait, stay right there. <laughs> we're super happy to have Shua on board. Uh, she will facilitate the kernel fellowships and other fellowships to help us make sure we get this right. Uh, I think she's just uniquely suited as a developer in a community that's kind of hardcore, uh, it's a tough uh, community to be in, and she is one of the top people in that community. Uh, we already have folks who want to sign up. We want to spend this week uh, signing you up as well. Come in and participate. If you are dependent on a long tail of projects that aren't represented in the current foundation or wherever you're working on, we can provide you a path to provide those grants. Because in addition to charging no fees for the first 10 mil, matching grants for the first 100 mentors and mentees, we are also doing a $500,000 matching grant. So if any of you want to set up a grant for projects that need help, let's say you just are really dependent on uh, a certain NPM package that's kind of struggling, or you want to help open SSL or whatever it is, Give us a list, give us an amount of money, and we will match that dollar for dollar up to the first 500K. I hope to leave this event this week with at least a million dollars to help out these projects. I'll pay half. Better application security, more resources, and more diversity all at the same time. That is the goal. That's not the goal for me or for the Linux Foundation. That's the goal for you. But let's do this together. We built the platform to do this together. Now, we didn't build this thing all by ourselves. We've got some folks here today who helped us build it as well. So our launch partners are HackerOne. We've integrated the platform with HackerOne. Martin Mikos is here today. Uh, we've integrated with Meetup. Let's say you want to fund a Meetup. You're a community and you may be small and we need just uh, a couple thousand dollars to do a Meetup because we have a couple hundred people coming here. You can go in, integrate, do expense reimbursement all through meetup.com and Community Bridge to get that done. Sneak, a commercial grade security and software composition analysis tool helped us build out the commercial grade security functionality. Sourced. Is helping with static code analysis and other security tools. And StackShare is helping us identify through crowdsourcing what open source projects people are using. Uh, but before I get to that, I want to show you that this is actually real. This is something that we're opening up to all of you this week. We're going to do a two-week closed beta, and then it's done. We're going to open it up to the world. Uh, this is something that we've already built. Let's show, this is going to be a little bit of a long video. And like, I, I don't know what happened. Shubra, where are you? Shubra, who uh, is right over here. Stand up, Shubra. Shubra and our development team have done an amazing job. Give them a hand. Uh, <laughs> building this thing out. Uh, Sh Shubra weirdly waited to the very last minute to create this demo video. Uh, I've never heard of that before in a software uh, demo, but we did a, a quick video of this. Not all the data in this thing is real. We, we've uh, cut it before we're, we're releasing the actual uh, tool GNA. So when you go in and log in after this and you want to check it out, there's going to be gated access. We'll give you password, uh, but uh, obviously it'll be a, a different set of data than what you're going to see here. But let's, let's check it out. Let's check out the platform and see how it works. The world of open source is not just about engineering and technology. 
It's a complex network of people and organizations, driving collective innovation to solve problems and create shared value. Community Bridge is a collaboration hub with the tools, projects, and the community at large needed to grow and thrive. Funding. Funding provides a simple and transparent service for individuals and organizations to back open source projects and groups. To get started, maintainers can add their projects by providing some basic information. the contributors they wish to support, and their desired fundraising goals, providing a transparent view of how this project intends to use the funds they are requesting. 20% will be allocated to development, 20% to marketing, 1. Approved, a project can be funded by individual backers and sponsoring organizations through a recurring commitment or one-time donations. Invoicing support is also available to sponsors all across the world for larger donations. The Linux Foundation has taken an initiative to waive all applicable platform fees and even payment processor fees for the first $10 million raised through the platform. Hence, 100% of the funds raised till we reach the goal goes directly into the hand of the maintainers. We want to set the precedent and encourage large corporate donors to follow lead for the growth of the community. Beneficiaries are invited to a project-specific expense by policy, where they can submit receipts for expenses and invoices for development effort. Maintainers are the first line approvers, validating that the submitted expenses are reasonable and legitimate. Once approved, Community Bridge administrative staff will verify funds are available and that reports meet regulatory compliance before releasing funds to the beneficiaries. The Linux Foundation will process necessary tax documents for anyone who donates or receives funds. All transactions Donations and expenses alike are tracked and are fully visible to all in a transparent ledger. Community Bridge also supports meetups and even scholarships for attending LF events. People. Money alone will not solve sustainability. We need to attract the right talent to support and grow the project. Community Bridge provides a matchmaking service for projects, mentors, mentees, and employers to create a sustainable growth model. Like funding, if a project hasn't already been added, a maintainer can simply provide some basic information. Specify the skills and interest areas they are looking for. Invite the community mentors to teach and advise newcomers. And how often or long the mentoring programs would run. Finally, communicate what is expected from prospective candidates and a list of to-do screening tasks before they can be considered. Once approved, the project is available for accepting applications from prospective mentees and funds from sponsors and potential employers. Individuals interested in growing their skills and being mentored can get involved at any time by creating a profile and identifying their skills and interest areas. If interested and applicable, they can also sign up for diversity scholarship opportunities. The Linux Foundation is taking a lead on creating a more open and diverse community and will be providing a dollar-for-dollar -dollar match for the first 100 diverse mentees. 
Once a profile is created, candidates are auto-matched with projects looking for similar skill set and interests as theirs. They can apply to any project of their liking, though. Applying is a one-click process, but to finalize their application, candidates must complete the tasks assigned to them. These are the same screening tasks that the project manager defined and could include writing a cover letter or submitting a pull request for a coding challenge. Not to be left out, a critical piece of the puzzle are the mentors. These are skilled and experienced contributors who will be responsible for advising and guiding the candidates in the program. Maintainers can invite mentors based on need and availability and often play the role themselves. Once invited, mentors are asked to build a simple profile to showcase their knowledge and experience to prospective mentees. The goal is to feature these hero developers who educate and inspire our community, whose tireless efforts make this possible. Finally, there are many organizations that not only thrive from open source technology, but who also foster and participate. We want mentees graduating from the program to have viable career options, which allow them to remain active contributors and grow the project. To this end, we encourage organizations of all sizes to get involved first through funding the mentorships, but not just end there. Organizations can benefit from Community Bridge by hiring program graduates and employing them to support the projects they depend on. They can show their interest in the project or specific skill areas they are looking to support and commit to providing job interview opportunities. Security. The goal of this service is to provide visibility and actionable data for maintainers and funders so that they can make informed decisions on areas to develop or where to fund. Vulnerability reports are generated by a daily scan of the project repositories and the dependent projects and libraries mapped via project manifests. Supported languages are Node.js, Ruby, Java, Python, Scala, Golang, .NET, PHP, and Docker containers. Defects and their severities can be tracked over time when injected. Looking deeper, we discover a host of security defects, some of which are fixable by a simple upgrade to a library or package version, and some of which we don't have a simple published fix and need to change the codebase. Maintainers know their code best and should analyze for any false positives. Triaging the defects, we can find associated CVEs, common vulnerability exposures, and CWEs, common weakness enumerations. These vulnerabilities and weaknesses are directly linked to the research in the National Vulnerability Database. In the CVEs, there can be simple fixes identified. For example, just the upgrade of the dependent library to a specific version. Real-world evidences of this issue are also published, sourced from hackers or fellow developers. Clicking on the HackerOne report, we can find a bug captured during a bug bounty program. Even steps to reproduce the bug have been provided by the hacker. Similarly, we are able to access the research associated with weaknesses, CWEs, linked to the NVD. The service is also designed to provide early warning to vulnerabilities which have been detected but may not have been logged into the NVD yet. Triaging another issue, where there was no easy upgrade path-based fix, we get to see PRs from fellow developers, which you can use as a potential fix. However, our goal is to just provide recommendations on possible remedies to the issues and leave the actual fix to the discretion of the maintainers. We can find all upstream direct and transitive dependencies based on daily scans of the project repos. Each dependent library or package is listed into an app dependency tree. When auditing the app stack, this data is very handy to validate issues around incorrect builds and mapping the root cause of the security defects. As a funder or user of this project, you can view all the different licenses in the stack the most interesting part of this data is that we also determine if a dependent library, package, or project is already on board the funding platform. If so, as a funder, you can choose to back the dependent package along with the master project you are currently looking to fund. 
This creates a network effect of sorts, and sponsors can fund or back an entire stack instead of just a project to enhance the sustainability of the ecosystem. For select languages like C and C++, and in particular for projects that operate at the root level, example Linux kernel, and don't have dependencies listed in manifests, we provide static code analysis. This is an early feature, and we plan to expand support beyond C and C++ to all major languages. You can find a detailed list of issues detected by the static code analyzer available for the project maintainers to review. Maintainer review is needed to weed out false positives, which may not be applicable or handled elsewhere in the code base. Exploring a detected issue, you can see the code level details where the issue is manifested. Static code analysis doesn't just capture security defects, but all potential performance level, for example, memory leak, security level, and code level defects, for example, null pointers. Projects can allocate funds towards running a bug bounty program, and hackers all around the world can submit real-world reproducible bugs that are validated for authenticity. You can see summary metrics around program details, bounty amounts, bugs detected and hackers paid, etc. Anyone can view publicly disclosed bug overviews for the project, but maintainers have privileged access to the detailed full disclosure information. We provide crowdsourced usage metrics about the project. These metrics include companies and individual apps using the project as part of their stack. This information is gathered from users who have voluntarily produced confirmation around the use within their private enterprise or public community environments. Although there is no concrete guarantee of this data being accurate due to the voluntary nature of it, it does provide indication to funders about the adoption of the project and its impact across the industry at large. All right, thank you for bearing with me uh, on that. I wanted to make sure that we showed you that this is real, that you can take advantage of it today. Again, we're gonna do a two week closed beta, and then we're gonna uh, release this to everyone to participate on. I wanna take the next few minutes to thank the folks that we've co-developed this with. One of the things that makes this possible and one of the best parts about uh, the being at the Linux Foundation is we've built this in a modular uh, way that is very API driven. Meaning that we are not an organization that's going to build out a commercial software composition analysis and uh, security vulnerability tool. We're gonna partner for that. We're not gonna build out a bug bounty program because that's a lot of work and we don't have the network. We're gonna partner with a whole bunch of folks and I wanna bring them up on stage uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, but before we do that, I want to bring up our newest Linux kernel fellow, uh, Shua, to talk about the mentorship program. Shua, come on up uh, and talk to me about what we're doing with the kernel community. Please welcome our newest fellow, Shua Khan. So uh, tell us about uh, you know, what we're doing. I think you already have posted a blog post about this, uh, probably like we wanted you to wait, but the last few minutes maybe. Uh, but tell us about the mentorship program for the kernel community and uh, about uh, how you came to come to the LF. Yes, uh, so I'm really excited to be here. When Jim asked me to come and work on the mentorship program at LF, I'm like, yes, I want to do this. Because um, I've been working with in open source and got involved doing my journey, doing Android, um, mainlining the Android code, and then went on to do other broader initiatives things, uh, such as helping Greg Crow Hartman with stable release maintenance, and then also kernel self test maintenance. The broader things, I gravitated towards them partly because it's important to have, um, such as Linux's foundation piece, for a lot, lot of the ecosystem, it's important to have the foundation strong. Um, when, so the important piece of that is we have um, maintainers, we have lots of developers. Maintainers have critical subsystems, they need help. So we want to continue to bring new talent and new uh, developers into the ecosystem. Kernel programming is complex. It is a large subsystem. Large subsystems 
and it's large, and it is, uh, it's important for mentors, maintainers to be mentors in helping the new generation of leaders to grow and continue to sustain the ecosystem. So that's why I'm, this is really, I'm excited about this because I want to do this, so. And so we're gonna, we agreed, so the first five mentees on the Linux Foundation, Nation. so uh, it's a three month program, $6,000 each, you get a $5,500 uh, payment and a $500 uh, travel stipend. Uh, and they're gonna be, you're gonna be leading the charge to get these kernel developers to act as mentors uh, and to get these diversity candidates. I should mention right. we are only going to pay for the first five that are diversity candidates. If any of you wanna pay for additional mentees, we would love to work with you. Go into Community Bridge and fund it, but uh, you're gonna be leading that charge. Yes, yeah. So today I'm asking mentees to come and join and mentors to come to guide all these mentees, mentees coming in. And we have, this year, uh, we are going to be doing two full-time um, ment mentorship programs, summer, upcoming summer, and then fall, and one part-time. We do want to include part-time because there are a lot of people that cannot spend full-time doing the work, so we would like to include um, people that can only spend part-time. So next year, we want to increase that to three full-time programs and two part-time. Yeah, we really want to move the needle on this. You know, when Shu and I first started talking, we we're like, hey, listen, we can partner with organizations all over the world, bring diverse candidates in, you know, quash that relatively large bug backlog. That, right. that's, <laughs> the, that's really, that's really important. Yeah. And we want to do that and we want to improve the kernel quality, also make the um, strengthen the diversity and actually add diverse people into the community and strengthen it at the same time, and then also we want to be able to train the kernel um, candidates and you know kernel developers to make them available for the community partners. So yep. that is also very important. So new job candidates for you, if we can improve the kernel, create more diversity in the community and long-term leaders, and find these folks jobs, that would be a great outcome. Thank you so much. Thank Shua. you, Jim. I look forward to working with you. So we've also been uh, working with some partners to help understand the requirements of open source program offices in terms of what they need to create mentorship programs for projects that they support uh, and to provide grant writing. And to that end, uh, Remy DeCostmaker from Twitter uh, has been helping us out and we'd like to, I'd like to invite him up on stage to talk about his perspective on Community Bridge and what Twitter is going to be doing with it. Remy, come on up. <laughs> All right. Hi there, everybody. Hi. <laughs> What's good, Open Source Leadership Summit? Uh, my name is Remy DeCosmaker, and I help hackers work together to use their powers for good. Uh, I've been doing that for a while now, and most recently, I helped to run the Open Source Program Office at Twitter. Uh, Twitter, maybe you've heard of it, uh, is a social network. It's what's, where people go to find out what's happening in the world. And it turns out that Open source is a very important part of our origin story. Uh, open source has been baked into the DNA of Twitter since the beginning. You know, everything from our microservices architecture, our build tools, even our emoji are released open source. So we have a broad set of concerns and we are committed at Twitter to improving sustainability and diversity in open source. And the community bridge project, this partnership, it helps to align a lot of different things. It helps to align upstream mentors with downstream participants. It helps to integrate third-party services that a lot of us in OSPOs tend to depend on. It helps to improve the transparency of where projects are spending their time and their resources. It helps to align and provide incentives. And ultimately, it builds trust, which is one of the most important things. Um, we have sort of a thesis in the open source program office at Twitter, um, and by we I mean mostly me because I brought it to it. Uh, the idea is, is that to grow anything, you need three things. Heat, light, and love. It's a little sappy, but <laughs> it's true, right? Um, in open source, there's no guarantee that any of the seeds that you plant will grow, but you can provide 
the best environment through which for those seeds to grow. And that's each of those things, the heat, which is the activity, the resources, the time that you invest directly, the light, which is the visibility that you bring to the projects and the community of people doing the important work, and then the love, which is the support, the culture, and a lot of the kinds of things that we're hoping to bring through initiatives like Community Bridge. So over the next year or so, Twitter is going to be experimenting with this platform. We're really excited to work with the partners. We're really excited and thankful for the invitation, Jim, to be a part of this. And you know, we're gonna need all the help that we can get. We're gonna ease into it. We're gonna start small with some of our healthiest communities. We're gonna ramp up with some mentors, some folks from the inside that are willing to help because it goes beyond just throwing money at the problem. We have to grow the community. You know, We don't just have, uh, you know, it's not just a free riding problem, it's a community problem. And we need to build the operations and support for those resources to go where they need to go and be transparent and build trust. And Community Bridge is one of the ways that we can do that and we're excited to partner. So thank you, Jim. Thanks a ton. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Good absolutely. Board as well. All right, that's not all. So uh, Guy Pajami from uh, Sneak. We couldn't have done it without you, so uh, you saw a lot of code out there for uh, dependency analysis and security vote detection. Sneak is an enterprise software composition analysis and security company uh, that has helped us build this platform. We really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about what Sneak does and uh, how you've been helping. Sure. So good. Thanks, Jim. So uh, thanks. You know, we're excited to be a part of Community Bridge and uh, and this initiative. You know, fundamentally, I think the reason I'm excited about this is that open source, you know, is hard. It's amazing. It's hard. Uh, it's hard for me. It's hard for consumers. It's sort of a new model of ownership. It's just complicated. And I do think a lot of the responsibility on us as foundations, as vendors, as tool providers, is to make it easy. To make it easy to do the right thing and simplify it. So at Sneak, you know, if you don't know much about us, you know, our our thesis has very much been around making security easy, and specifically making security easy for developers. First, we try to make it easy by just finding out about vulnerabilities in these open source components. So we, you know, we have our own systems that try to sort of track on the web. You know, there's a lot of open source activity that doesn't necessarily make it into a CVE or an organized database because, again, practices are not perfect. So try to fish those out and make it easy to just find and know about all these vulnerabilities in one place. And then second is around integrating and making this, uh, uh, the understanding of which components you're using and whether or not they are vulnerable easy as part of your development process. Um, and last but not least, we have a lot, very much sort of this mindset of developers, right? When we talk about all these contributors, all these great people that we're pulling into the community, uh, these are, generally speaking, not security experts. They're not auditors. Most of them are developers. You have to think about what does it make sense? You know, what, what tool, what is, solution does a developer want? And one, for instance, key aspect of that is developer's job doesn't end with finding issues, it ends with fixing them. So if we give them a solution that just gives them an, a very long list of problems, uh, they're not gonna be very happy. <laughs> and so uh, we built a lot of these automated remediation uh, components. But I love that all of those are within Community Bridge because you know, that makes it generally easy for, for people to do the right thing, you know, for the maintainers, for those creating and contributing to the project, to understand uh, which components they're using, fix, find those vulnerabilities, fix them, do the right thing. People want to write high quality software. And for the consumers to also notice the right thing, understand you know, which vulnerabilities are in here and make your decision. Understand whether, whether that is a, a crippling element for you or better yet, if you can chip in uh, and help yeah. and move those forward. So really excited to be a part of this project and uh, see it thrive. Thank you, Jim. Thank you a ton. Uh, so, uh, we also got some help from uh, someone who has been prominent in the open source community for a long time, is a good friend of mine. Uh, the CEO of HackerOne, Martin Mikos, is here to tell us about how uh, his community, which is sort of aligned with the open source community, uh, is going to help out. You know, Martin, I've talked to, to Linus about how, you know, as a developer, sometimes it's super hard to understand the mind of a hacker. Right. Because you just have to, he, he just, I remember he told me once, he's like, I don't even know what's in those folks' heads. <laughs> but you're helping us by connecting these two communities together. Tell us about the HackerOne integration and what you're doing at HackerOne. We, we could say that with enough hackers, every security challenge is shallow. 
<laughs> We've heard that before. <laughs> so some things stay the same and some things change. And this community, and we are always a place with lots of people who disagree on every single detail, but always agree on collaboration. That stays the same. What's changing now is that every piece of software you develop has to be secure. And it wasn't like that, and I know, because I was there developing all that insecure software that's now full of vulnerabilities. But now we have assembled at HackerOne. We take us our mission to help you build safe and secure software. And we have an army of 330,000 ethical hackers who've signed up with HackerOne to hack the hell out of your software and tell you what's wrong. Because you will get hacked anyhow. And it's better to be hacked by these kind people here on the posters. Those are some of the best hackers in the world. When they reach a certain level, we make a dedicated poster. So each one of those is one particular human being who's a brilliant, brilliant hacker. But we have over 300,000 of them that will help you. And we're just delighted about Community Bridge because now it enables us to bring this to everybody in this community and allow you to get access to these people, even if you feel like you don't have the funding, you don't have the resources, you don't, have to, you don't know how to do it. We can now do it in a way that's easy to get going. And that's what's so exciting with all of this. Thank you. We hope to find a lot of bugs and fix them. I really appreciate your support, Martin, and uh, we're happy to have you. Let's give it out. Thanks, Jim. Two more left here. So uh, I called up, uh, what was it, a couple months ago, uh, the CEO of StackShare.io. How many people here have seen StackShare.io? It's awesome. It's this cool tool where you can go on, see what open source projects people are using. You can compare the projects and so forth. I called up Jonas and said, we're doing this thing. We can't figure out what everybody's using. Can you help us out? And Jonas was kind enough to help us. Please welcome to the stage Jonas from StackShare.io. Thank you. All right. Can hold it? All right. I'm going to, well, first of all, honored to be here. Thank you very much, Jim. Nice to have you. Um, I'm gonna make this very, very brief, and I've got some very simple slides here. Can I start? You gotta hit, hit it hard. There you All go. All right. Uh, so for those that aren't familiar, uh, StackShare, our mission is to make developers more productive by helping them learn about technology through the people and companies they trust. So the problem is there's hundreds of thousands of tools out there, right? There's open source, self-hosted, Cloud, SaaS, PaaS, the list goes on, right? Very difficult to choose which technologies you should use. We're solving that by allowing developers and companies to publicly share which tools they're using in their tech stack. Um, and as all of us in this room know, uh, the modern tech stack is actually dominated by open source technologies, right? So more often than not, you're using open source whether you know it or not. Um, and so when <laughs> Jim called me up, and said, hey, I've got this thing that I think you guys could help with, I immediately said yes. Not only because of you know, the fact that it's Linux Foundation and the work they do is, is important, but because this specific initiative, Community Bridge, is actually a very holistic approach, and it's not sort of this Band-Aid one-off solution, right? Being able to uh, sustainably fund uh, security patches while increasing the diversity within the open source world is actually an amazing way to uh, help the entire ecosystem. And StackShare, um, we're honored actually to be a small part of the solution here. Um, so uh, why are we here? So the, the purpose of StackShare, you know, the reason we exist is because when you're going to adopt a tool, particularly open source, one of the main questions you have to ask is, well, who else is using it, right? Um, and right now, it's kind of a difficult question to answer. Um, a lot of projects don't tell you who's using uh, the software, right? Which companies and um, who else is using it. Some bigger projects do um, and that have the resources. So this is where StackShare comes in. Um, we've actually uh, built the world's most comprehensive uh, sort of like open source and SaaS uh, usage database that's crowdsourced. Again, this is all public data. Um, and we've brought it all together in one platform. Um, and the reason that this is important is because when you're funding a project, this is actually uh, one of the things you want to know. So 
Uh, what you'll see here, actually, starting today, we've, we've released a sort of new aspect of the platform. You can not only see what companies like Uber are using, but you can actually see why they chose specific tools in their stack, uh, particularly open source tools. So here you'll see Connor, who may be in the audience um, from Uber, um, actually talking about Jaeger and why they decided to build it and open source it under CNCF. Um, and so all this data is now available through a brand new GraphQL API endpoint that nice. a set of endpoints <laughs> that we uh, opened up specifically for Linux um, that gives you access to all this information. And when you're browsing profiles on Community Bridge, you can actually see um, who's using these projects. Um, and we see this as the beginning of much deeper integration and, and larger partnership. But again, we're really happy to be able to help out here and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. You. We're almost done. We're in the home stretch. Last but not least, uh, Iso Khan. He is the CEO of Sourced. Uh, when I first got introduced to him, he said, uh, Jim, we have all the code and we've cached it all and we're taking uh, machine learning tools and we're trying to get insight into patterns of code, uh, their security implications, all sorts of stuff. I said, can you help our open source projects with those tools? He agreed to do it. Welcome. I said. Pleasure to do so. There you go. Nice to do this from you. Yeah. So today I'll be talking a little bit about some of the things today we help enterprises around the world with and how we can start bringing this to open source projects. One of the main emphasis I want to make, though, is already what Jim had been talking about is that today as developers, we spend a massive amount of our time, close to about 40% of our time, actually on bad code. We spend hours debugging, refactoring, fixing vulnerabilities. And one of the things that at Sourced we've introduced today to open source communities, to enterprises, to individual developers running this on their computer is this notion of engineering observability. The ability that today when we take an enterprise environment, I'll talk a little bit later about how this reflects in open source communities, at the very top level we set behavior through guidelines. That can be a technology we choose to adopt or a best practice series of best practices we're going for. And then further we go down in the organization, we want to start enforcing these guidelines. We want to make sure that new code that gets added actually follows these practices and we can fix things proactively. And at the end of the day, when the actual developer is touching the code, we want to make sure that we can actually prevent and fix you know, violations. This isn't so different today from governance in an open source uh, project where at the top level there you have the maintainer uh, and then a widespread of practitioners below. But at the end of the day, when we look at projects and we look at code and, and engineering, in our opinion, it comes down to three parts. It comes down to people, it comes down to the actual behavior, and it comes down to the technology that's there. And what we see in open source reflects very much what we see in enterprises. Uh, it's not common for us to work with a bank or a telecommunication company and find that you have over 20,000 projects, repositories spread out across your organization with dozens of years of history. And today what we do with Sourced is we can analyze that talent. We can analyze who is actually writing that code, what skills do they have, who are collaborating across projects. Uh, we can identify knowledge leaders through pretty interesting machine learning models that are actually analyzing the core of the source code. But we can also take all those guidelines and best practices and turn them into code. Code that later you can then see where do we violate it, track the impact, measure it, uh, and also prevent violations. And while doing this, and already Jim talked a little bit about that today, both on the upstream and the downstream, understanding what do you actually use, right? What are the languages and frameworks and libraries that you depend on? But not just that, how does your architecture look like? What is the impact of changes in your dependencies? And actually measuring the change from one technology to another, often happening in, in big projects. So at Sourced, we have two main components. Uh, we're fully open core and open source company. What you see here actually is, is available on GitHub. Uh, we run as a fully transparent remote organization. We are incredibly grateful and depend on and are, exist today because of the open source community. The Sourced engine is what ingests all of the source code, Git version control data and other data sources and actually turns source code into a universal abstract syntax tree, a universal language that allows you to do complex analysis over what's actually in your code base. 
And on the other hand, we have Lookout, which at the code review level helps you to take those codified rules and prevent further uh, actual violations. And a lot of this is powered by machine learning on code. About four years ago when we started the company, we decided to create a community for researching how machine learning techniques can be applied to source code analysis. At the time, we felt quite lonely, us and a handful of academics. Today, we're very happy to say that that's a massive community where we see researchers from almost every computer science university around the world, and a lot of the companies here in the room also actually doing interesting work. And so what we're announcing today is a lot of the things that we've been doing today are on the downstream. We work inside large enterprises to analyze all of the source code that's there. We have a community edition that you can run on your computer and analyze the source code that you locally have. But what we're going to be starting to do at Linux Foundation is taking all of those upstream projects and providing that same level of analysis uh, with the source engine to those projects. And so we're very honored to be part of this. Uh, we hope that we can start playing a small contribution to actually supporting open source. So thank you very much, Jim, and looking forward to seeing what the future brings. Same. Thanks, nice. All right. That was a marathon. I appreciate you all standing here. We still have a couple of good speakers. But I wouldn't be uh, a very effective person introducing something new at the Linux Foundation and I didn't, if I didn't just give you a, wait, there's more. Uh, so last night, as we were uh, outside uh, having uh, s'mores uh, on the lawn, uh, I got a call from uh, Nat Freeman, the uh, CEO of GitHub. And GitHub, at the very last minute, he has decided to up the matching grant. So instead of $500,000, we now have $600,000 in matches. And so I'm looking at all of you. I'm looking at all of you. We got uh, two weeks private beta here. Let's go GA with this thing with a, a couple million dollars in funds for these projects that need it. Better security, more diversity, we can do this all at the same time. Funds for these developers, this is what we want to do. The last thought I'll leave you with, and then I'm going to introduce our next speaker, is this is the only the first 5% of the functionality that we're going to be offering on Community Bridge. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how we can create tools to make open source communities better to provide for easier ways for people to on-ramp to communities, to reduce the time, the mean time, to pull request response, and so on and so forth. And so throughout the year, we're going to be releasing more, and we are always looking for co-development partners to help us make open source better. There's no profit motive here. We're going to try and keep these fees at zero. We want to build out robust functionality to help us all collectively help the open source projects we depend on. So I want to thank you all for spending a ton of time listening to me uh, and hope you all participate in Community Bridge. With that, let's give a round of applause for our partners here.